G'day everybody and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. I'm your host Emma Doyle, coach for success in sport and business. G'day everybody and welcome to the Coaching Podcast. My name's Emma Doyle and I'm here with Tennis with Emma because her surname is a bit tricky for me to pronounce. So Emma, how do you pronounce your surname? Burkic Butska. Pitch Bookska. Oh, see, I, no. I struggle. Tennis with Emma. <laughs> Tennis with Emma. Uh, Emma, so happy to have you on the show. You uh, contacted me, actually, to, to my pleasant surprise via Instagram, and we've connected ever since, just been talking coaching, talking tennis, and we're excited about some potential collaboration in the future as it relates to Ace Coach and Tennis with Emma and online education. Uh, the more people we can reach, the happier it makes us, I believe. So look, let's get into our formal part of the podcast. The first question is the Australian spread. Now I know you're from Bosnia, so I have no idea whether Vegemite <laughs> even exists there, but have you tried Vegemite before? What's your take on it? So I went in 2009. Oh my God, that's so long ago. I played junior Australian Open there. And honestly, I don't remember trying it. Yeah. I don't remember mm -hmm. if I tried it or not because it was so long ago. But I'm sure that if I had like some crazy experience, I would remember. So I don't know if I like had the courage at that age. You know, I was young and I was like, yeah, maybe I'm not going to because I just heard different stories. So I don't. I don't remember trying it, but that my husband tried it and he was like, that was awful. So, <laughs> There's that. so you might not be introducing it to your little, your new little children coming into the world. It is something we grew up on. It, it is a unique taste, of course. Uh, so because you answered that way, Emma, you can choose. You can either choose a coaching moment that went well and what were the lessons or a coaching moment that went not so well and what were the lessons. What do you want to kick it off with? What do you think? Mm. Let's go with the bad first. <laughs> Get that um, out of the way. Yeah, seriously. Uh, so I, um, when I was in a group, um, I don't have, I don't have a really like bad experience when I coached that I can think of straight up. But I can think of when I was a player, um, one of my coaches, he believed that teaching uh, 10 girls the same way, the same style was working, right? Where me as a coach now, and I've learned a lot from that, that that is a wrong way, that you cannot, because we're, we're all 10 different personalities. We're all came in with 10 different game styles, but we had to do um, serve and volley, everybody, because statistically at that time that worked. So we all had to work on that. Um, so for me, um, as a player, it didn't work because it just confused me more and I was really lost and I know other girls were too. And then, um, now looking at from a coaching perspective it's like it's a definite no so for me that was that was a bad bad experience that i had mm -hmm. um um so Fantastic. yeah i love that yeah. i love the fact that you know coaching is not one size fits all and if we don't begin with the player in the center first and foremost then you've missed the boat on coaching um, the more we can be curious about people and how they learn is is absolutely key. Uh, so I'm uh, hopefully that experience didn't last too long for you. Um, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it did um, like three four years. Yes, mm -hmm. it did, and it would like change constantly. It's mm -hmm. like always something different, and I'm like, uh, I'm at, at the end of those four years, I didn't even know like what my game style is mm. what player I'm anymore I lost confidence it, 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 yeah it was I was all over the place and I had to like find that again mm -hmm. so you know now I'm really trying to learn from that a lot and you know all coaches have different perspective right we all think differently we coach differently that's the beauty of it right so 
for me as a coach, like finding that how I can get to the player and get the most out of them, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, even in a group, you know, like you cannot, you know, just one, 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 one thing. You have to figure it out how to get to that person and what works the best. So yeah, that definitely, you know, it was, I always tried to find positives and things. So I think I learned a lot from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and everything happens for a reason in life. I know it's cheesy to say, but it really does. Um, I so I agree with that. We're meant to be where we're meant to be. Really? Yeah, really. And it's helped you so, no doubt become a better coach. What about on the flip side? What about a coaching moment? It's so, so rewarding when a player comes to me and tell them, tell me how much I've helped them. Mm. Um, or that because of something I said, that their game changed a lot. You know, like I love coaching the little kids and developing their game from early on. So, you know, I had some players that started with me and, but moved away to another uh, state or somewhere, but are still coming back to me for advice. They're still, um, you know, saying how much they love tennis because of me. And that to me, it's like, I mean, no amount of money, awards, nothing can compare to that feeling that that kid, when they were six, they fell in love with the game because of me. And now they're very good. You know, they're 10, 11. They're very good when they come, they come to visit and to practice with me. So for me, that is very rewarding that I made them fall in love with tennis, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So that being said, I try to find a way, you know, to get to them at an early age, show them the beauty of this sport. And here they are now loving the sport and they will always remember me as a first coach that made them fall in love with the sport. Super awesome. And thank you for sharing. The next question is called the sliding doors question. Definitely transitioning. So I started my professional career very young. I won my first 10,000 when I was, when I just turned 16. Um, So, you know, my life was just, you know, living and breathing tennis Actually, since I was nine, everything was tennis for me, you know, because I grew up in a small city, in a small country. Yeah, which um, city and where? So it's Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the city is called Lukavac, which has maybe 10,000 people, the whole city. <laughs> wow. um, so, okay, let's go back. Th- that was probably the sliding door moment, too, because... When I was nine, I played um, a little mall tournament in Croatia. Mm-hmm. Um, and the two best players, so the winner and the runner-up, get to go to America and play and compete against the U.S. Mm-hmm. So Europe against U.S. So in that little mall, there were like almost 200 players. Um, so it was 10 and under. So I came up short in a semifinal and then I competed for the third place. So I won the third place. And then the winner was Ayla Tomranovic. Mm-hmm. And um, the runner up was a girl, Martina Caragaro. She's from Italy. And when, it, so I just fell short for one spot. So whatever, I went home, I didn't make it, but she got sick, Martina Caragaro. And they invited me to go so for somebody from such a small country to go to United States at that point was huge right so me and my dad and Ayla Tomanovich and her dad we all went uh, to Houston Texas and we competed against two Americans and it was this whole I mean huge event and we won we got this huge trophy that you don't get to keep but you can take it home for three months. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I came back home with this trophy. And in my, like, I was, I don't know, third, fourth grade. I don't remember. And I came in, I I remember that was like insane. Like all the kids were carrying me in the trophy. It was a huge deal. Like the mayor of the city 
prepared a huge party. <laughs> no, it was insane. So imagine that for a young girl to be like that and then, okay, tennis was my life, right? Which I think it was bad because now as a coach, I don't think at the young age, you're supposed to just decide on one sport and just play too much, too many tournaments because, you know, I got tired of it down the road and it was just too much because there's just tennis, tennis, tennis. Obviously, I loved it then, but, you know, it was a lot of good and bad things. But then for me, that I guess the sliding door was just you're you're into tennis and my parents and they didn't know anything about it they were not tennis players mm -hmm. they didn't have money like um, even now when I talk to them it's like how did they how were they able to provide they don't even know They're like, <laughs> we don't know I got fortunate because I was invited a lot from like age of 11 to different um, ITF development um, camps because for undeveloped countries like Bosnia, Serbia, Bulgaria, at that time, they would take like the best players and we would travel to different tournaments. We would travel and practices. So like I would go for like four, six weeks and play together at that time with Dimitro was with me, like in the groups because he was from Bulgaria, um, Radu, Romania to Radu, Albot, um, there were some Krajinovic, Pele, Jumho that are also top players now. Um, so I was fortunate that I was able to go and I was getting paid, not paid, but everything was paid for me there. So those were good experiences, you know, and I developed a lot as a player traveling and being with other kids and meeting different coaches from all over the world. You know, those were like, honestly, the best times. So then when I was 16, I was in Spain practicing an academy that was also from ITF. They provided that I go to Spain to an academy and train there. And in that academy, I got to practice with Muguruza. At the time, we were, she's a year younger than me. We're training all the time, competing. Uh, but all the bigger players like Lopez, Robredo, Schiavone, Panetta, Fonini, they were all practicing in that academy. So I get to train with them because I was this young, talented player, 15 years old, and I would play practice matches with them. I would beat Schiavone, I would beat Panetta in practice matches as, as a 15 year old. Professional tournament in, in Spain, I won it from qualifying. I was not even like ranked or anything. And, you know, like that was for me like a lot of great experiences. But then I started getting injured at 15 a lot. And I think because at an early age, it was just tennis, tennis, tennis. And my body, you know, if you just play too much tennis and you're using the same muscle groups over and over and over and over again, it breaks down. So I started breaking down. And actually, when I went to Australian Open at 16, the junior one, that's where I got injured, my elbow. And I remember playing and going to the doctor's office there at the Australian Open. Actually, Federer was there too at the same time. And it was bad. Like my arm would get swollen after playing a lot. And he told me there that I need to get the surgery. So I got the surgery. At that time, I had so many colleges reaching out to me, right? I didn't want to go to college, right? Because I'm like, you know, I want to play. But then I had to take six months off and starting all over again and blah, blah, blah. So then for me, it was like between like 16 and 18, between all of these um you know, either to go pro or go college, like, okay, which way, what do I do? And then my parents, you know, being parents and playing it safe, um, they were, you know, scared for me and just going pro because I was really pr in, pr uh, prone to injuries. They were like, okay, go to college, but I didn't do enough research on it. Because at the time, I really didn't want to go to college. I was like, I just want to play. 
tennis because I want to play pro. And But they're like, you know, go because you never know if you're going to get injured more. And, you know, the finance says, we don't know if we can support you. And if like the ITF is going to keep supporting you, how it's going to be. So go there and then you, you can go pro anytime. I wish that I looked into colleges more and deeply, like more, more into that, you know, because I did like, I think two visits and that's it. And even when I did the visits, I'm like, okay, great. Like I was not interested in it, you know, like, whereas now I tell the girls that I'm coaching, like I give them the sheets, what to look at when you go to college, you know, like the pros, the cons, you know, if you want your career to go professionally after, like what you need to look for. I wish that I looked more into, into that that way. That was also like a sliding door moment, like pro college, pro college. And mm. it's like for college, my life changed a lot when I graduated. And then I played professionally, like maybe a year and a half. And then stopping with my pro career at the very young age that was also a huge huge thing because I was young and you know and then I went I have an, an accounting degree so I found like I got a job and I worked there three months I'm like no this is not for me this is not me and I went into coaching from there and those were like I guess the three big at the nine years old at 18, the college, and then when I stopped playing, competing professionally, okay, what do I do now? Mm. And making that switch of being a coach, a coach with like maybe six years of experience. So I would say I'm pretty young mm. and I have so much more. I feel from for me now, the next 10 years, they're so important, I think. Finding myself as a coach, as a person, as a parent, three sliding door moments. Yeah, yeah, three very significant. And I'm sure many of our listeners will relate in one to a maximum of three words. What do you think makes a great coach? Energy, connection, communication. Mm -hmm. Energy, connection, communication. I, you have to have that energy. You have to. There's no, like, you need to have the energy. Bottom line, there, I, there's no oh, more you and I connected <laughs> yes <laughs> connection with the player what I talked about earlier you have to connect and in order to like be able to help the person you have to connect because if there's no connection between the player and the person and the coach you, you it's a no-no and then communication the way you communicate and it has to be a two-way street I always say that to my students I can just talk, 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 but I don't know what came in, what didn't, you know, what stayed in. And I always, always say that. I, I try to catch myself, like if I see that I'm talking a lot, okay, I'd pause. I'm like, okay, uh, what do you think about that? What do you think, uh, what did you get out of that? You know, I always involve, even if it's a five-year-old uh, or a 70-year-old, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It has to be a two-way street. Fantastic. Me. I love it. So what's that one piece of information that really sparks your curiosity? What do you want to know more about? So much. <laughs> I, I really want to learn a lot. And I feel like as coaches and to be a good coach, you constantly need to ask questions and be curious and learn what is your way to get to the person? What ways you use? Do you have some words? Do you have some like strategies, like how to get to the person? With tennis coaches specifically, I would ask, what is more important for you? The technique part or the eye-hand coordination or the mental aspect of the game? So these are the things I'm still learning. Fantastic. And I think the other question too about how do you get to a person? It doesn't matter if you're coaching someone in business or in sport. Uh, when you start from that position of having more tools in your toolkit and more different ways to tap into different people, I, I, really, yeah. love, I really love that. So what age did you actually start playing tennis? How old were you? Seven. My dad 
had a cancer and he went to, that's why I think everything in life happens for a reason. He was, all the doctors in Bosnia told him he has three more months to live. He went to Germany, did chemo there and everything. Thank God he's alive, he's good now. But when he was there, there was one woman that was helping him and she had two daughters, bought them two rackets and they didn't want to play tennis. And she asked, hey, do you want to take the rackets back home? And he called me and he's like, hey, do you want these rackets? I didn't even know what tennis was. I was like, yeah, sure. And he said, since the time that he brought the rackets back home and I couldn't even bounce the ball in the racket, he's like, you fell in love with it. And that's why like, you know, it, it, it was meant to be. And mm -hmm. I was playing, playing. They started sending me to groups. They didn't have time to take me to lessons. I would put a backpack on one racket, just go alone um, at seven years old. The first four years of my life, it was war. So my parents didn't have much. So they just wanted me to play some sports. So they just sent me. And then six months later, the coach told them that they should come and watch me and that I'm talented and different from the other kids. So I started taking some private lessons. They started taking me to tournaments and at eight years old yeah mm -hmm, that, that, that. Mm -hmm. now put your coaching hat back on for a minute what do you think of the word talent you know when a when a child is deemed talented from a yeah. young age what are your thoughts on that I mean you can really see if the child is talented or not and it's really like some kids are meant for tennis and I you can see it right away and at six, at seven, at five, you know, and they love it. If they love it and if they're talented, right, I would maybe around the age of 10, between 10 and 11, choose tennis as just as a tennis sport and just focus on tennis. I would not do it at seven years old because they need to experience other sports. They need to develop other skills too so great sports that go together with tennis are definitely soccer swimming and then those are the first two ones and then I would do volleyball basketball really any sports at that age track and field um, it's great gymnastics it's great um, and then you know after 10 then you specialize in tennis but even when you specialize in tennis don't just focus on tennis. From an early age, it's so important to work on the fitness aspect and the strength. I'm not saying lifting weights, but there's so many exercises that, you know, I have kids come in, you know, and they are just going to these groups or going to these lessons, just learning forehands and backhands and rallying. But then I give them the jump rope. I give them the ladder the basic things they can do at 10, 11 years mm -hmm. old. Those are the things that need to be developed first. And then tennis comes, it's going to come e easier. Like I'm big on those fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Even skipping, I find that so interesting how young teenagers can't skip. It's uh, yes. cross point yes. coordination. It's, it's fascinating. Um, so you have two young children yourself now. Congrats. So they're little tackers. What if they say they want to play tennis or they don't want to play tennis? Or what, what are you going to do with your own kids? And will you coach them? I uh, met my husband also in college. He was a great uh, player too. He's a lefty, awesome player. So we're both tennis players. So it's inevitable that our kids are going to be exposed to tennis, right? Especially me being a tennis coach. My two-year-old, you know, he comes, visits me in classes, he picks up balls, we, you know, I mean, he's just all over two. And I do this like Sunday class where I go on the tennis court with him and some of his friends. And I make it like a fun lesson. I don't want him to think about it like, you have to go play tennis. You know, he goes there, I create like different obstacles. Like, you know, he's already doing the ladder. He's already doing the zigzag that some of the kids at five years old cannot do it. You know, like I think as parents already like creating that at home, you know, you can do so much at home from an early age. You know, you don't have to put them in classes, but 
you know, I make it fun because I'm already out there. I have all these little things. So equipment and then he's with the friends playing, throwing balls, catching, balancing. Um, so that being said, I'm definitely not going to force them to play tennis. We take him to soccer too. And he loves kicking the ball. He loves, like he loves also when he puts the ball down, he loves to take the racket like it's a um, golf, um, how do you call Hockey. the golf? Hockey or yeah. golf stick, yeah. Yes, the stick and he likes that. But so whatever he wants, as long as he's in sports and he's developing these, um, you know, fundamental skills and the balance, agility, coordination, fine with that and then we'll see you know we'll see what sport he chooses obviously I'm gonna try to coach him but I I have a lot actually good coaches that their kids are between six and ten and they bring them to me to coach them and I always ask and I was fascinated by that I'm like why are you paying me to coach them and they're like well, because they don't want to listen to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really think that's going to happen because I see that a lot with my two-year-old already. It's like whenever he's in school and over there, like a basic thing, like I dropped him off the other day and they're like, okay, Tao, go wash your hands and go, you know, sit down. And he just like, okay, he said, okay. And he went and I see him washing his hands and sitting down at the table. And I say, when I tell him at home, They'll go wash your hands. It's it's a disaster. So I think that's going to happen. Yeah. So I'm ready for that. I want to start the right way and like teaching him the right way, right things. Mm -hmm. And that's where your experience comes in. And that's where I need your help, you know. Mm -hmm. And we talked about creating programs, how you can do from early age, how as a parent. Mm. you can start working with your kid at home or in the tennis court. Well, so we can talk about that. Yeah, we can. I mean, even just mentioning it right now, one of the cool things about Emma and I collaborating, as in Emma's in tennis, uh, is just the fact that we both love real-life case studies. And you literally do have two little case studies. And this isn't to say, you know, we want to give them the best coordination possible to succeed in life and I love that I'm excited about you know working with you on on their development and also other parents out there I don't know about anyone else but I love uh, off topic but I'm a sucker for a reality documentary or uh, a real life story so I'm I'm excited to see where we where we end up going with that but definitely cross-body coordination locomotion throw and catch and striking are you know, I could talk for hours on that topic because I love helping parents. One of my my mentors is Judy Murray, who worked with Andy and Jamie Murray at home and at the club because she was a volunteer coach, similar situation. And so many little games that she would set up to keep things fun until, you know, the boys were at that age around 12, 13, where she then got Leon Smith to, to coach them. But I love one of her philosophies is uh, let the activity do the teaching for you. So I really, I really love that. Um, and I'm excited to see, you know, what, what we end up doing there. But, uh, but I know one of your coaching philosophies is you believe in getting better every day. You can't improve everything. However, every day you can improve one thing with keeping that bigger picture in mind and setting goals and, I know you believe in the process each day is how you improve. Did I summarize that? Yes. Yeah. Enjoy the process. You can't accomplish, you know, everything in one day, in one lesson, in one week. Last week, in one of my group lessons um, with um, eight-year-olds, seven, eight-year-olds, I told them to bring a jump rope. So first of all, most of them didn't even have a jump rope. So we had to wait that everybody gets the jump rope. And I can count on one hand how many actually could do it. So I gave them a task every day, every day for five minutes at home. Five minutes. That's it. Do the jump rope. Mm -hmm. And let's see the progress in one month. I believe in, 
you know, setting the small goals, you know, short-term goals, then long-term goals, even with beginners or advanced players, anybody, it gives you more motivation, right? Um, you have something to look forward to or something that you want to achieve, accomplish, then enjoying the process, like you said, making it fun. You know, I grew up in Eastern Europe where it's more like, you know, strict and uh, there's no, how, how you say it, like cookie cutter here. I'm mm -hmm. trying to learn like, yeah. yeah. Cookie cutter approach. Yes. So Americans, it's that more cookie cutter, you know? So it's, I try to like find, I'm trying to find like in between to meet in the middle, which I think that's the great one, you know? With the kids until the certain age, like you said, learning through games, through fun. But then, you know, when they get to a certain age, then be more specific. And when they're ready, you, you can improve every day uh, by five minutes with jump rope. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mm -hmm. going to improve. But if you do it once a week when you mm -hmm. come to tennis and then you don't do it for a week again, it's like, uh, the lessons too i have a lot of lessons that they're like okay we want to start with 30 minutes a week right 30 minutes a week one lesson and then every time like we come back next week it's like we're not getting anywhere it takes so long mm -hmm. but then i give small tasks for parents because i think parents need to be involved Great. a lot of parents think i have just send my kid to tennis for a tennis lesson and that's fine no we have to work together right so then i communicate okay at home do this and this and this everybody has five ten minutes mm -hmm. in the day. Mm -hmm. everybody mm. so yeah and my philosophy on that as well just just adding value there is we have to use the the language kids relate to giving them little missions and little uh and yeah. as as you know i'm big on decision making as well so maybe yes. they jump rope for a minute and then they have to you know when the parent claps their hand they've got to run forward uh and then skip for two minutes and then three minutes and build it up like that so you know i think we have to st always tap into uh the development of the way the brain the brain develops uh, as well as the the hand-eye coordination in little missions for kids these days i think that's it that's important as well i love the blend of your eastern european background with that with the gamification like i think you need both i think in today's society it's not just let the kid make all the decisions uh, I think it's a balance between how and when you do that to help unlock the learning that lives lives yes. as a player. Yeah. I passionately believe in that. So back to you as a player, you know, looking over your college resume, ranked number four um, in the nation, NCAA Division One, seven-time All-American, number one ranked player in Europe under 16s. We spoke about that earlier, and then the Big 12 Conference Player of the Year, M. Fantastic at Baylor University. Well, let's start with the positives of, of college tennis. And then maybe also you alluded to, you wish you had maybe done a bit more research. Could you talk about both both of those things? Yeah, great on the paper, you know, great, Results. great things. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, it was just obviously a lot. We're like, you know, you talk about the success, you know, what gets you to success. I didn't start off good in college my freshman year was not good at all because I was adjusting so when I talk about the research and about college I wish that I paid attention more that I talked more to the girls that were in college back then how their practices looked like what they were working on just what the approach what the coaching was at that time, I just thought, oh, it's going to be fine. I'm going to practice. I'm going to play tournaments, you know, compete. And then I will, you know, go continue with my professional career. But it was definitely not like that. The load that you, when you just get to college, the load of like the schoolwork and the practices, you're practicing so, so much. You know, you're not used to all the pressure and from getting good grades in order to get the, to keep the scholarship and all of this stuff you just have more pressure but what threw me off a, a lot was the coach back then believed a lot in statistics 
right? So he would do a lot of research constantly, right? Like he was just on the computer, what the stats are, statistics, 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 and it was just black and white. We used the ball machine a lot and we could not back up from the baseline, right? We practiced, all the balls were coming hard and we had to stay inside the baseline and just hit the balls in their eyes. And that was it. And we all had to practice that way and be like that and stay at the baseline. For me, I grew up on red clay, right? And coming there, and uh, I was lost. I was like, what is going on? But then you cannot complain. You can't. You just have to follow. You just have to follow. There is no, if you want to have your word, if you want to say something, no, 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 you have to do it. And that's it. Mm. So, you know, as an 18-year-old, as not, it, yeah, it, it was tough. So I was not happy at all then you know just doing so much of different things you know I right away I had talking about prone to injuries stress fracture right away right away I, after a few months so then I couldn't play I was in the boot all the time there were like four freshmen and then four seniors and then yeah it was it was not good then this and I honestly wanted to transfer I was looking into schools to transfer, but because of my assistant coach, which she was amazing, uh, she's a head coach now in Tennessee, Allison Ojeda. She, uh, do you know her or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she said like, Emma, you know, like just give it one more year, give it one more try. We'll try to work with you and work with like your style of your game style and that year was amazing because the coach didn't want to lose me as a player right so they adjusted to me right and that year was my best year because we communicated what I talked about that year it was amazing I mean I I was ranked I played number one singles and doubles were like top 10 played like all these great schools and I had a great doubles partner to team work better as a whole mm -hmm. just because we were not just working on one thing mm -hmm. was more focused on each individual mm -hmm. because at the end of the day yes you're on a team mm -hmm. but it's an individual sport yeah. and it's not black and white so at the end of the year so it was May I ended up being like I think four in doubles and five in singles in the nation I was in a roll I didn't lose a match I was so confident that was like the best tennis I've played ever like I was I mean I was so confident I felt like when I'm there on the court nobody can do anything whoever is on the other side I feel like I can I can win I, I miss that feeling so much <laughs> but then uh, I was preparing to go to the individual NCAs and that in one practice, I was actually with Allison and one other girl. What happened? I twisted my ankle. It was like a day before. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I could not go and uh, it was it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Then that summer, I, um, I got injured, my shoulder. I played some pro tournaments. So then coming into my junior year, I had to do a shoulder surgery. Mm -hmm. um, that threw me off a lot. That's another thing. When you're in college, you know, it's great because you have all these resources. You have all the doctors. You don't have to worry about when you're injured. You know, you have mm -hmm. trainers. You have everything. That, that's amazing. Um, you have a great support. But then, as the best player on the team, coach wants you back. The season is starting, right? So it's like, okay, you got you to gotta play even in pain. So like I went back earlier than I was supposed to, mm. you know, and even served some underhand serves because I was not supposed to play. So basically another research I would do is to, to see what the coaching philosophy is when you're injured or coming off the surgery, if the coaches rush you back to play or they give you enough time to recover. Mm -hmm. I understand they have a pressure from, you know, bigger. I just didn't have enough time to recover and that's why the next two years I always 
kept going back to that shoulder problem because I never let it heal mm. all the way. Then I started compensating with other parts of my body where then I was getting other injuries and it was mm. just, it, it was a mess. And then he went back a little bit, another statistic stuff. And, yeah. you know, because I'm already like, almost into my senior year so it, it, it's funny it, it's funny like how colleges work I hear good positive things right you hear good and positive things mm -hmm. but you don't really hear much negative things but I love Baylor I love Baylor as a school great facilities it's a small town uh, people are so nice I mean the professors, uh, everybody cares about you, truly, truly cares about you. You know, like whenever you're in college, whenever you're, um, I mean, anywhere, they, in the classroom, the athletic train, everybody cares about you. But then I didn't really connect with the coach. I mean, I thought I did most of the time, but then it kept going to the same thing, same thing, same thing. And one thing that, I'm going to throw it out here. I don't know how many people will listen, but I hope a lot. Not a lot of people that even know me. Almost, I don't even know who knows this about me. My senior year, my last, my last semester, for the longest time, I didn't know what was going on with me. Like something was off. Like I didn't have energy to finish the practices. I was, um, I couldn't sleep. Then... I was up too much, um, then I just wanted to sleep. I, it, it was a mess, something was weird. Nothing would make me happy, blah, blah, blah. And we did all the blood work, we did everything. And then uh, finally they took me to the psychologist and I was diagnosed with major depression. And honestly, I think it's all connected, you know, like just because the way everything was run there, and, you know, and it was affecting me slowly, 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 slowly was adding up and everything was going great in my life. I met my husband. Uh, we were preparing for the wedding. The wedding was right after college, like 2015, May. I graduated in June, the wedding. Everything was great in my life. I was playing fine. But then, you know, it was too much. It was too much. And even to this day, you know, it's been what now? six years i'm still dealing with it and i still have to be on the medication and it all and you know now you know more people are coming out and it's not like a shame to say it but i still you know don't feel i'm like a little bit like shaking now just saying it but you know i think it's something that's important to say out there because it did affect me affect me a lot the whole everything that was happening there so so definitely do more research. I always thought I was going to have a great relationship also after with my coach. And I do have with Allison. But he told me he was going to help me out with my professional career as an alumni. Never any help. Nothing. Zero. Zero. Basically, it was just like while I was there to get the most out of me. And that's it. You know, now looking back at it. it and I believed sometimes that he actually cared but but no uh it was not and i i hear i hear good stories of coaches that actually cared and helped and good positive ones but you don't hear a lot of negatives but i know there are a lot of negative ones too you know so here i said it i don't know how it is now if things have changed or not well first of all thanks for being vulnerable <laughs> the strength in vulnerability as brene brown always says uh, but it's great, I guess, for anyone else who's going through something similar, just to hear that it's a daily challenge, but you're, you know, you're okay. And you, yeah, thanks for sharing, because I think it is an important message. I think in tennis, you can feel so alone, even though you might be on a team. It's often, you know, when you're maybe the relationship with your coach is, is not quite where it needs to be. You can feel like the whole world's against you. And yeah. I think also what's been really interesting about your story, Emma, is just how much success you had young. Yes. And so then when you feel that, the 
councillors got the throwing a party back in Bosnia, you got the big trophy and, and all the rest of it. So it's very easy to think that you can see your career unfold. Still WTA 140 in the world is still a fantastic achievement. Maybe it's not quite what you can see it, obviously, number one in the world, and top 10. So thank you for sharing that. Because we're on that note, do you mind then just sharing that decision after college when you stopped playing pro? How long did you play pro after college? Not a lot. A year and a half after, and it was tough. I felt alone, and I couldn't afford a coach really coming out of college because I was based out of Florida here. Um, I trained uh, in Delray Beach in an academy. I had a good deal there that in the Pro World Academy. They really helped me out a lot. I mean, so I was playing, practicing with great players at the time. Naomi Osaka, Sofia Kenin, Coco Gauff. We were all practicing there. Then I would travel alone to tournaments. You know, I would... I was miserable most of the time, honestly. Yeah. You know, you have one good tournament, then you have five bad tournaments, you know. And um, so it was lonely. I was not happy anymore. And, you know, I was, and then I was injured in my back for four months. I had to stop. And, you know, I could have kept going more, right? I could have kept going more and fighting. But I decided not to. I kind of had enough <laughs> through my life, you know, mm. since the early age, through the suffering and then the college. And a lot of injuries, too. A lot of injuries, you know. Even now, like, I try to play when I play a little bit more than usually. Like, my shoulder right away, I have to see a chiropractor twice a week. You know, it's like my body is just broken and I'm about to be 30 years old, you know. So because I didn't take care of it in time. You know, I didn't do it the right way. And then I didn't stretch enough. I, that's another story, you know, that from an early age, you have to. So I wish I had this brain now uh, that, that I have now back then, obviously, mm. who doesn't? I decided to settle down. I mean, I was already married, but then I decided, you know, just to stop and I literally call Turkey. I just said, no, no more. Like I said, I could have gone more. I didn't. Sometimes, even nowadays, I ask myself, you know, how everybody does. Oh, maybe I should have. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, this and that. But the bottom line is I made that decision and I'm here now and I'm making the most out of it. And I'm still in tennis because I love it. I love this other side now. Right. Mm -hmm. I love to share my story. I love to help other kids as much as I can and adults. And. I found myself in coaching. I really have. And it didn't click right away. It, it took me now maybe for the last year, I've, I've been feeling, you know, very good about it. But first five years, been, you know, trying different things, coaching at different places, different people. And now I'm finally like, okay, okay. It, things are coming together. I was questioning, do I stay in tennis or not, you know? Mm -hmm. But this is my calling and this is my life. And now it's just, you know, finding a different way. I have two little kids, like you said, a two-year-old and a nine-month-old. And I want to be with them as much as possible. You know, as a female, it's, it's tough um, because I couldn't really give my maximum and a lot of things because pregnant and all of that stuff. But now... I feel like I'm having more time, but also not <laughs> mm -hmm. because of them. But I'm finding very good balance yeah. on court. And that's why I'm working more off the court and online to be able to work more from home, mm -hmm. you know, and do what I love and share my knowledge Yeah, because that's the world we live in right now. And this is what I want to touch on also. A year and a half ago, I started an Instagram account and it's it's brought me so many new opportunities i've grown so much i've learned a lot i've met so many people and there's still more that's coming and it's always every day every day and i reached out to you i got out of my comfort zone you know like i usually don't reach out to people i wait for them to reach out to me you know but i don't know they're just my gut was telling me and i'm like okay um 
and I did when I called you the first time I'm just like oh my god she's probably like thinking well, what what does she want who is this person and then even like it it took you some time after to reach out to me I'm like oh, that's a lost deal but I'm I'm happy we connected I'm happy for the opportunity to work with you to learn from you I think there's a lot of good things we can we can do together it's fabulous for people to hear your journey and the fact that a year and a half ago you started your Instagram account and if you're not following it, please, what's the hand actual handle? How do people follow you? It's tennis with Emma, but with one M. With one <laughs> M, Tennis with Emma with one M. So check it out. Emma posts lots of really interesting videos, very catchy videos. She gets a lot of people talking about tennis, which is what we want. You know, sometimes yeah. I know certainly when I started putting up some of my videos at the start, I was like, oh, I didn't show it perfectly or that's not a great video. And so it's not easy. So hat, hat off to you. You take the plunge. And I like your attitude around you care, of course, about the people, but also yeah. you stand in your own truth. You're like, this yeah. is what I believe and I'm going to yes. put it out there because obviously, yeah. you know, the minute you put things out online, uh, there's 500 opinions, especially in tennis. And I mean, one of your yeah. philosophies is, is there's not one way to coach. Please check out Emma's Instagram account. It's been wonderful having a chat with you this morning. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, uh, our connection and your communication. Uh, your three factors there that what makes a great coach. Really yes. Important. I love that. And uh, I hope everyone gets on board with your energy and your love for the sport. So keep doing what you're doing, Emma. You're doing a fabulous job for our industry. So thanks for being on the coaching podcast. Thanks, Emma. I appreciate you so much. And in today's episode on the coaching podcast, we certainly heard about the importance of finding the right US college for you. And our show is sponsored by Transition Coach for Athletes helping student athletes find the right US college sporting fit with the academic balance. So check out www.transitioncoach4athletes, that's the number four, .com and start your US college journey today. And I'm a global speaker and performance coach helping you unleash your potential. You can find me at emmadoyle.com.au. Thank you for listening to the coaching podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a coach and thanks for listening.